Hello, it's Mary Beth here. How are you guys? I'm so happy to be here. That last presentation was excellent. Um, all right on par with um, things that I see daily in my clinical practice. As Beth has mentioned, I am a pediatric vascular access specialist. Um, my first job was in pediatric um, oncology, but we also admitted all of the GI patients. And so from the very beginning of my nursing career, I specialized in tunneled central um, catheters, ports, picks, et cetera. Um, from that job, I became a parent educator. And in that role, I really saw best ways to kind of transition out of the hospital into home, what products and needs there are, um, how confusing it can be to navigate different home health companies um, that might practice a little different from your institution. So today I've put together um, a presentation that covers kind of what you should expect, what best practices are, um, and I want to make sure we save lots of time for questions because I know they're coming up and I'm completely capable of um, answering questions for the physician ahead of me and also for myself. Would you guys like me to share um, my screen for the presentation, for my slides, or do you have yes, that? With that. <clears throat> yep, you do it. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Let me just take one second to get everything going. Sorry. Here we go. How's that look, everybody? Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So there are, um, as I said, I specialize in pediatrics, but I also consult for um, adult patients as well. And I'm a hospital wide resource. So um, it's been something that I've been doing for, for quite a long time. Um, but the objectives of day are really to just to review the best practices as we know them. And I can just tell by the questions in the chat and some of the comments that some of you have a lot of experience um, and some of you are newer to kind of managing central lines at home or by yourself. And so we'll cover those and we'll review the best ways to prevent infection. The previous presentation did a great job of highlighting um, all of the ways that we can do infection and then talking about the locks, which I appreciated. And then um, I also like to talk about recognizing when something is wrong or when you need to escalate or ask for more resources to so make sure you feel empowered to ask for those next steps. So a lot of the evidence for managing central line care and maintenance is based in a hospital setting, and there actually isn't a lot of um, published data of how the bundle should look differently at home. For those of you that are part of a children's hospital, Solutions for Patient Safety is just starting to highlight an ambulatory group to see like what does that look like when you're actually in the home but our CDC guidelines our national guidelines a lot of the literature that we follow is based in a hospital setting and it is a gap so I'm in a PhD program and a big focus of my research is going to be looking at what the central line does in the home um, but the, the basics are the same in that having clean hands immediately prior to accessing any part of the tubing is vital to preventing infections. Um, the line insertion piece is also um, important, but that's a short part of the line. And then, you know, I've had patients that have had lines for 12, 15 years that take care of them really well. Um, in the hospital, our goal is to remove the line sooner, but as you know, this isn't an option for, for what we need it for, for our treatment and care. And so then it really plays into line care maintenance, making sure we're changing um, at scheduled inter like intervals and then making sure that the dressing is intact and that the tubing is protected as best it can be. This is the WHO guidelines for hand hygiene. And so obviously there's a hospital bed there, but you have to think of at home when you're running around throughout your day, um, when you're going to access the sterile tubing of the line or prepare all your meds or get your flushes ready, um, really washing your hands immediately prior to doing that is, is key to make sure that you um, haven't contaminated them in the process of, of doing the million other things that everyone has to do to get by in their day to day. The bundles that are published in the literature are really insertion related, line access related, and dressing change related. So I'm not going to dwell heavily on line insertion, but we'll talk more about the access and the dressing change. Um, the insertion bundle, which um, the, the doctor previously mentioned, is 
is that these lines are placed anywhere from operating room, a procedure suite, and at the patient bedside. There is a lot of evidence um, to suggest that um, the, the patient should be covered head to toe. It's a sterile procedure. We have sterile products. All of that is monitored. Institutions should have processes in place that a second person is watching the insertion to make sure there's no break in sterile technique. Um, and then the sterile field is is um, maintained and that the inserter is wearing a cap, a sterile gown, and a mask. And so when we're putting the central line for the first place that there's not a possibility that we are introducing any other bacteria at that time. Now the access bundle, um, as I already mentioned, hand hygiene is important for that, for immediately accessing the line. But the goal of the, the infusion system is that really that we maintain a closed system. Labeling is important for in-house or for patients or children or family members that might be going in between places to make sure that um, across the team it's communicated when things are due to be changed or when they have to be changed. Um, we really do try to cluster or minimize multiple entries into the line, which is why a lot of our, our home systems are set up so that we kind of have a one-stop shot that we can get everything together. And then this is what is probably the trickiest, trickiest thing that we deal with in the hospital or outside of the hospital is um, protecting the tubing from contamination, especially for little kids that have, you know, normal that um, activities that they want to play with the tubing, or if you have, you know, you're going through your day to day and you have tubing that's exposed, or you have other um, drains or other things that might help contaminate your tubing, is to really figure out a way to protect that sterile tubing that's going into the blood to be safe from from getting dirty, and then what to do if it does become contaminated, how you can safely clean that um, with alcohol and change it out as needed. This products, um, as you probably can all, ex you know, just validate and explain just as well as I can, is that there's a wide range of products that help um, minimize infection for the line access piece. Um, we do find value in having alcohol pads or caps on ports that aren't going to be accessed just to have an extra barrier. Um, we also have alcohol pads or we have she pads or different kind of products that we can use to disinfect just in time as needed when um, you're concerned the cap might have come off or been contaminated or just to do an extra step before you're actually going to get into the tubing. The needleless access connector um, range of products is vast and a lot of times it depends on who your DME is and what contracts they have and what pricing they're able to get. Just know that these single-use sterile items should help you um, maintain a closed system. You should be able to access them easily. You should be able to keep them clean or scrub them easily to prevent infection. You should have enough supplies that if something did go wrong that you could replace it. I was following up with an infection and found out much later that the mother had only received um, bare minimum of these caps and one of the needless connector caps had become stool contaminated and she did not have another one to put on um, and felt that she just had to do the best she could to clean the one that she had. Um, so that's been a big um, concern that like she didn't know she didn't have enough. I didn't know she hadn't been given extra just in case. And so really just feel like you can assess your, your home products and then have that relationship with your DME to make sure you have the extra supplies when you need them. And if you're not getting way, getting where you feel like you should, that's when your medical team can also come and help intervene. And then you also have your tubing and your add-on extensions that are also sterile one-time uses. Um, in this day and age, and I'm speaking for myself at um, my own hospital, but we're having so many more back order shortages in these products as well um, as other products that help with home infusion. And so sometimes a sub might be put into place that you know I'm not fully aware of, or the family might have questions on how to use it. So just feel free, like if you are getting a product that you're not familiar with or you don't feel is right, that you ask those questions because we don't know unless you say something. I see there's a question in the chat about what is CHG. So chlorhexane gluconate is a cleaning alternative to alcohol. So we have the 70% isopropyl alcohol, and then we have chlorhexane gluconate. Um, and they have 
different efficacies and how they clean and how they clean medical per, like um, products. So I'll talk a little bit more about CHG when we talk about the dressing changes as well. And we will have time to get back to any additional questions. For our dressing change um, expectations and bundle is that when we utilize standard dressing kits, so you should have your supplies that are in the kit. That's an easy way for everything to stay sterile, be easy for any for yourself or if you have a home nurse assisting to be able to have the products available in one place that's sterile and easy to open. A lot of times in peas, you also are given smaller products that you like have to drop in. So you wanna be sure that you have products that are easy to open and drop onto a sterile field without contaminating them. Um, we clean the skin. Um, a standard cleaning agent is called chlorhexane gluconate. And so that comes in a wand or in a swab stick and it has a residual activity that can keep the skin and the site clean um, for several days. Um, so we recommend a, a week dressing change for those. And typically they'll have a 30 second scrub. Um, and I, I say three minute dry time, the official labeling says to, to wait till dry. I've just found that if I have a set time for a dry period, that the product actually does fully dry. And it's through the drying process that alcohol and these cleaning agents um, disinfect and kill bacteria, same as if you're cleaning your counter or any sort of cleaning agent. Um, by having that dry time, you're going to um, kill the bacteria, but also decrease the chance of having some skin irritation. So at my hospital, we say three minutes. It can be, it can be less than that. We just sort of set a time. The alternate cleaning agent, since the Clorox and gluconate is often paired with um, alcohol, and some patients don't tolerate it, their skin might react or get irritated, or um, some institutions choose to have babies less than two months not use um, CHG, is that we have the, we call it just kind of the brand name of Betadine, which is the orange swab sticks. So I always say when I'm using it, like I'm painting, I'm painting the patient, painting the child, painting the, the person, um, but you start at the center and then scrub your way out and concentric circles, it comes with three sticks. So you repeat that process three times, let it dry. And then some institutions may wipe away the excess and some institutions may leave that in place. The dressing, the goal of the dressing is that it is um, a sterile, transparent dressing. Some of them have our border reinforced. Um, some of them have other reinforcement measures to keep the dressing in place longer. I have found that certain DMEs keep their um, dressings with one vendor, but um, if that vendor doesn't work for you, that you're able to, to swap it. And I have a slide about dressing specifically on the next one. Um, but you also will change the dressing if it is coming up, if it is loose, um, if it is starting to peel off, um, because you wanna keep that site sterile and um, occlusive with that dressing. For the Broviacs and the tunneled lines, um, we often will loop them to keep the tubing up a little bit shorter. And then in one of the pictures that the previous speaker said of having a broken line, um, we have found that often those lines are breaking at where the skinny part of the catheter meets the fatter part where the clamp is, that that's an area that it naturally weakens. And so based on that, we always keep tape on that juncture to prevent that break from eventually happening. But otherwise the dressing changes typically seven days. I learned at a conference once that typically we will go five to seven days is how you, long you should expect a dressing to last. Um, if you're having to change your dressing every day or every other day, that's a concern that you might eventually um, have more skin irritation, which is something we really want to avoid. So I found this um, in a Cochrane review. And so there's lots of evidence actually on different types of dressings and what may or may not um, work and what may work for one person might not work for the same person. What might work for you might not work for you five years from now. So just know that there are lots of different options. Um, and so if you find something that you're not tolerating, it is worth escalating to ask what else you can send um, just to try something different. Some people just benefit from having a break from one certain type of adhesive and trying just a different style for a little bit. But ideally a dressing is gonna provide the barrier from micro, microbial colonization and infection. 
and be adequate securement to prevent the line from getting pulled out, whether that's a tunneled or a pick or a port. It's comfortable and non-irritating, easy to use and, and cost-effective is what a goal is for dressings. And this is just the, the overall umbrella terms for each type of dressing is that um, in, for a while it was um, gauze and tape. Right, we would just cause and put tape over it. And then the next iteration was just a standard polyurethane dressing that just was clear, like a clear tape dressing. And I still have some patients that do really well with um, just that basic level without any sort of border on it. That that's the dressing that prevents a lot of their irritation. Then we have highly adhesive polyurethane dressings bordered polyurethane dressing. So it typically will have the cloth border and I would say that is most standard. Um, there's also some dressings that have chlorhexidine gluconate impregnated either into the plastic or into like a gel pad in the dressing. Um, there's other medication impregnated dressings that may have a silver component to it, hydrocolloid dressings or, or no dressing at all. So based on that wide range of different types of dressings, you can kind of see that there's a lot of, of options that, that you could escalate to one way or the other. I have found we start with a bordered polyurethane dressing. If people are really struggling with that, we make sure, do we need to change a cleaning agent or do we wanna alter the dressing? And then we might try a different brand of a bordered polyurethane dressing. If that doesn't work, then we might go back to a standard polyurethane dressing or, or go a different way too. So it's really kind of like partnering with the family and figuring out what to do. And I see in the chat, there's lots of um, communication back and forth and that's totally perfect um, to, to share with each other, like what kind of brand names have worked for everybody. Um, and I, I have, we, we have found that my hospital, we need to have the whole toolkit. I just, I don't have one. I have a full range of all the dressings because what works for one might not work for someone else. Securement of the dressing is either we have a sutureless securement device. So usually that's a different type of tape that can just like hold the tubing um, onto the patient's body. So it's not gonna pull out at the insertion site. Sutures um, are also sometimes used or no, um, general securement, either it's, if it's tunneled, it often has a cuff, so it's kind of secured in the chest and then the tape serves as its, its securement. So as I've already said, there are lots of options. One doesn't always fit all, um, but I can't stress enough, like just reach out if you just feel like what you have isn't working for you. Because sometimes by the time you get to the point that your skin is, is irritated and blistered, it's, it's harder to get that reaction back than to try something sooner. Um, and then, um, removal of the dressing is also important. So we request or send home the adhesive remover pads or there is spray. The spray you can get over the counter, you can get Amazon um, if you're not able to get it um, through your DME, but to have a way to gently take tape off that you're not ripping um, really decreases your medical adhesive related skin injuries that then when you have to reclean the site, then your skin can kind of flare up and get, react to that. So we do try to carefully take a dressing off um, so we don't contribute to like a future skin injury. For, since I'm a pediatric nurse, I have to have this whole section. There's also a broad range of products that are meant to help secure tubing um, to normalize play and normal behaviors, but also will work for adults too, if you just want something kind of out of the way. So just know that there is additional products out there that can assist um, with securing the tubing and keeping it, like if the tubing gets pulled on, it's not pulling on the dressing, it's pulling on this sort of wrap device. And some of it's adaptive to um, clothing. Some of it is like modified wraps and vests and stuff. And then some of it is just a cover up because sometimes you just want to have like that kind of private and be able to tuck up the pick into your sleeve or something and not have everything hang there. So these are just an example of a few of them, but there's, there's lots of um, companies that have um, developed and evolved and come up with, with solutions. Lastly, I want to just talk about the environment. So it's something we do try to focus on um, in the hospital a lot, but cleaning the environment or, or having a, a secure space for you to work in your home um, is important. So um, the body like itself, and if you've been hospitalized, you know, fairly recently, you might've noticed that we're doing more CH chlorhexidine gluconate, like also products on the skin. And that's meant to kind of decolonize 
your body that might be picking up more bacteria that's in a hospital setting. There's really no data for use in the home at this time. Um, but why we do it before surgery and in the hospital is really to kind of take a layer of that bio burden off. Um, but there's still some talk of like what, what to do at home, but really just being clean and having um, a way to like keep off some of the normal bacteria that lives on your skin. Like we're all covered in different versions of staff. So to be able to wipe that off at some point to, to stay clean is helpful. Ah, I started a timer to like keep me on track. So I'll catch up a little bit here. Um, the environment, just so that you have a place that you're able to set your supplies. So some people go and buy like a new tray or a new cookie sheet or their hospital gives them like a new Tupperware. That's something that's just a hard surface you can wipe down and keep your supplies in. Um, when Katie presented, she had a bookshelf, you know, full of supplies. So it's kind of hard to find like your space that you can set up things to keep it clean. But just know that your areas that you're touching and walking and touch walk, like interacting the most with like your phones, et cetera. It's just a good idea to once a day be able to wipe down your environment, but also have a nice place that you can keep clean. And then I, part of my PhD program is like better ways to transition the family into the home and the training that you may need or the training that you want your caregivers to supply. So Katie had mentioned that having people help um, you know, it's like if they offer, it's good to have their help, but then it'd be also nice to have like a set way to help train other people to step in and help you better. So I would have to say that there is some research on the best ways to do that. I would, I think it's evolving. I think within the next five years, we'll see this really bloom up a lot more. But for intestinal failure, children and families in particular, there was only seven articles that talked about how you prepare a family to go home and do take care of the child in the home setting. Um, I know some studies, especially in the hemong population, are talking about ways that are app-based that you can communicate better with your team if you have a concern, if you have a missing product, if you have a concern with your line. So I just wanted to like give a hint of that here, um, knowing that I, this isn't fully evolved yet. And I do think it's an area that we just really need to grow. But when you have people, especially for those of you that are parents that have children that are, you know, have lines that other people are caring for is, it's just important that anyone who may interact with, with your child's line or even your line is to make sure they have the adequate amount of training. So whether that's a, a home nurse that might be coming in to help out um, or a family member or caregiver, just know that just having some sort of standard education on the best way to prevent infection is really important and helpful. Um, and can help your, your team um, support you better. And then um, the signs of what can go wrong. So the previous presentation did a good sign of when lines are breaking or when the sites don't look well, um, or when your dressing isn't adhering as well as it can. Um, just know that you should feel empowered to, to reach out and ask those questions if you feel like something isn't right and I don't like how this looks and it's really uncomfortable, what can I do to help um, and have the resources to do that. So that's where I will end. And then I'm happy to take questions um, or keep up with the chat if anybody has something. I'll start you out with some questions, Mary Beth, first of all. So thank you very much for joining us. I just always love your style and you just, um, we've um, helped each other out over the years many times. I wanna start with a couple of questions from, uh, that were as a result of Dr. Mundy's talk. So yep. one was he mentioned best practice is an annual check of the tip. Um, oh, that's sure. something that's ever happened in my life. And he's been online for 12 years. Is that something that we really should be doing? Is that something we should talk to our teams about? What's your thought on that? Yeah. So honestly, I have found, especially for the tunneled cuff lines that the tip doesn't migrate greatly unless you have like a big growth. So like the only time I've seen a big tip migration was a, a kid who had a port and it was from three to seven. He grew enough that the tip wasn't really central, which you would expect, right? Um, but some do wonder, and we've discussed it at my institution, should we just do a quick x-ray, you know, once a year and just make sure the tip's where we expect it to be? Um, and then and then what's your plan on that? So I wouldn't say it's a formal recommendation, um, but it's certainly not a, a bad idea, especially if you've had any line issues, like blood return isn't as optimal as it was before. Um, or if it's flushing a little bit harder, it's always worth to do an x-ray. That was going to be my next question is how would we know if the tip wasn't right? So that's two, it's not flushing right or it's not drawing blood right. Potentially yeah. could be a line yeah. tip too. 
Typically, if the tip is a little bit too short, um, it, it, it's a higher incidence of getting fibrin. And then the fibrin is harder for you to get a blood return because your like brachiocephalic entrance into your SVC is so much smaller than your SVC that blood can't flow around it as quickly. Hmm. So what are some other uh, things that might cause us not to be able to get blood return that we need to check out? Yep. So basically for um, blood return is it's usually like a suboptimal tip location, but some catheters or some patients just have a higher frequency of getting fibrin and you can be doing everything perfectly right and you just have a higher frequency of developing fibrin on your catheter. And in those cases, um, you know, we, we might look into having the tip be in a slightly different position or we might be more proactive with giving an alteplase or something that will break down that fibrin. But yeah, okay, what it looks like you. is if it's harder to flush or just not getting as great of a blood return. All righty. Um, so one of the questions was, if most studies are done on central lines, if they're done in short time, short term line users as opposed to long, do you know any? Do you know that? It depends on exactly what they are looking for. So um, I would say if they're evaluating infection like CLABSI, they they pull all the central lines together and then they can pull out what line types and like duration of lines. So a lot of the studies. Um, for PICs are, are showing that they might have a higher infection rate, but they're also more commonly used in an ICU for a short-term version. So some places, some centers that do home infusion now are um, collecting their data for home infusion lines, which are typically the tunnel long-term lines, and then reporting that out too. So that's actually really like good data for us to review. But yeah, it's across Thank the board. You. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks for answering these. We got tons of questions coming in. We'll answer as many as we can, and then we'll wrap up here in a little bit. But um, quite a bit of the comments over on the chat were people talking back about dressings. And one of the things that was brought up is, does, is a dressing absolutely necessary? Because one person said they don't always use a dressing, and that became controversial on the chat. So can you address that? Yeah, so um, I haven't explored this personally in my clinical practice, but let's say if I had a line, I, I would consider it more, but the, the thought is if you have a tunneled cuff catheter and you know the cuff has adhered into that tunnel track, um, the recommendation is, is unclear if you have to have a dressing on. Most places still do more from securement and not having that cuff get pulled on, but the idea is that the cuff's there, it's blocking off that tunnel track. Bacteria that might enter the tunnel track won't get to the bloodstream because the cuff is blocking it. So um, for some of our, like I'm a hemoc nurse also, so some of our transplant patients get really bad graft versus host disease, and we may consider not having a dressing, but um, we clean the site daily, put gauze on, and then our biggest concern is, is the line coming out. And yeah. I would ask who decides if we need a dressing or not, because let's because so, best practice till, still is to use it for most cases. Um, can you address the that? So we'll just pull it out. <laughs> yeah, so most medical teams will recommend to keep a dressing on. Um, it's hard for you to actually tell if the cuff is really adhered. Like the test is to like yank on it, and I would not suggest doing that. Um, so I the recommendation um, has been to have that bordered dressing on. And I'd have to say even in the last 10, 5 to 10 years, dressings are continue to evolve. Um, they keep getting better. You just have to Ab find the right one. Um, somebody's asking how often a pick should be replaced. So there's no, if the pick is functioning, there's no recommendation to replace it. Um, from the standpoint of vessel preservation, you don't want to replace things routinely. Um, with all of our care maintenance bundles, we should be able to keep a pick in safely for a long period of time. My record pick was in for years for a hemophilia patient. Amazing. So, yeah, yeah there are things you can keep it there. <laughs> so somebody pointed out that one, one word that is used is sterile. Is the word sterile like for dressing changes things? Is it really that or is it really antiseptic? or aseptic, I should say. Yeah, so I think the goal, um, and if you're if you're an OR person, sterile is sterile is sterile. Um, and when I started as a nurse, I was learned aseptic technique, but then we did transition it to use sterile gloves, have a mask, use all sterile supplies. And if you contaminate something, you're expected to replace that with a new sterile device. So I would say for dressing changes, the intent is that the process is sterile. Um, for accessing a line, it's typically aseptic, no touch technique, which, which is a little bit different using sterile supplies and having a clean environment. So 
I know um, if those of you that are really savvy, the dialysis world has slightly different variations of dressings for their HD catheters, depending on center. So yeah. I'm just saying what our infusion nurse guidelines recommend. And then uh, Dr. Kenberg on the comment said, it is recommended always have a dressing of your line, even if it's tunnel as most lines are. That is the standard recommendation that she she's recommending. Um, what I would say is this, is there are sometimes exceptions to the rule, but you can't decide that you're the exception to the rule. This really needs to be a team decision. This needs to be something. I'll give you one really quick example. We were in the hospital one time, Manny, we didn't know that it turned out to be a CHG allergy and his line, his arm was a mess. And so together the surgeon, the team, the vascular access team and us, we came together and we decided, what are we going to do? And we tried a novel concept for a very short period of time, but it wasn't one day I just went, eh, I won't do a dressing today. Um, so if, if you have like severe mast cell activation, I know that's one of the conversations, it may be worth a conversation with your team, but do not just remove dressings. Just, just well, don't, well, that's not what we're well, saying. No, sorry. And I didn't mean to, but, um, but there are a whole line of products that are more wound knowledge based that work really well for central lines as well. They're also sterile products. So often um, wound nurses help make decisions on um, dressings based on if you really do have a lot of skin um, injury or irritation that they are good partners with us also. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so Another question was contact dermatitis for dressing. Do you change it first? What do you change to first? Like they use their team uses IV 3000 or something like that. Um, what do you go for? What's your first line of defense for contact dermatitis? When I review the patient or like visualize the patient, if it, if like the center of the skin seems really fine and it's the border, like the edges are what's really starting to be irritated, we would do um, a, a dressing intervention first. If it's diffuse, like throughout the whole skin that's had any contact with a cleaning agent, um, like nurses can't diagnose any sort of allergy or anything. So we can't even diagnose contact dermatitis. We'd want to get, you know, more consults in place, but I would be more, I would escalate to a different cleaning agent first. If it's diffuse, the whole, everything that's touching the dressing seems to be irritated. Um, one, because scrubbing alcohol back over the site will be really painful. I mean, I'm a pediatric person, so you don't want to scrub alcohol into open skin. So um, we would maybe take a break from chlorhexane gluconate at that point, just until the skin could heal up and then make a different decision. And often, sometimes it doesn't last forever. One irritation to one product sometimes just needs some time to recover. Well, one of the things that I did was a skin patch test. I did my own at home. Like we had started having these allergy sensitivities, whatever. And so I literally said, okay, what are all the things that are touching his skin? And I took the exact opposite side of the skin and I drew straight lines with these things. And then the next day when there were some that were bright lines, I said, well, let's make sure. And I drew a line in a different spot the other way, just to make sure. And I figured, well, he's at least reacting to something. I cut little dressings up in little squares mm -hmm. and things like that. A second question is how early Urgently, does a line need to be replaced if the cuff is exposed? Oh, that's a good question. Sometimes if the cuff is exposed, is exposed, it may not be central. I would say that's like kind of a bigger thing because often the cuff is sent it like a ways up into the tunnel check. So if the cuff is exposed, we're a little worried that the tip is in the right spot, in which case that would have to be changed quickly. But you'd want to so have that. more about that anything else. Yeah, that's what our. Okay. Been, yeah. And then how do you manage granulation tissue at the insertion site, like silver nitrate, a new site? What do we do for that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we have found, we have tried silver nitrate. I've also just tried silver dressings, like the people have mentioned that in the in the chat, like a silver dressing that can kind of help the, the tissue calm down. But if it gets really extensive, um, granulation tissue can be healthy and oozy at the same time, if that makes sense. Like the, the type of cells that granulation is lead to more drainage typically. And if we can't control that, it's contributing to the need to change the dressing frequently, we'll do a different site. To minimize once granulation, granulation tissue, once a patient's had it and we are switching a site, I really try to secure it well that the tunnel, the catheter isn't irritating the tunnel constantly because that can trigger more granulation tissue to grow. That's my, I haven't found evidence on that. That's just my years of experience <laughs> dealing with it. 
I know you uh, touched very quickly because you could you could give three days of seminars on infection itself, but uh, I know you touched on it quickly, but are all f infections preventable? So there's a talk in this, you know, in our population that we're talking about right now, it's, it's like the gut, like the gut is part of our body right and the whole idea of translocation of bacteria um and so when we're reviewing an infection that occurred in the home you know we we tick all the boxes make sure that you know nothing was was missing you everyone had the right supplies but sometimes it's like a gastric event happens and then you know the concept is that bacteria may may move from the gut into the bloodstream since they're so close together um but that's where um the, the locks and those type of technologies, I think really help in preventing that. Um, at least that's my institutional theory on it. Um, but yeah, the whole MBI injury and, and gut translocation doesn't preclude the need to also make sure that we're doing the best in our care maintenance to prevent infection that way too. So yeah, that's that's a good question. I don't know if we have all the answers for that yet. I think more research needs to be done on all sorts of things. We This population has been asking some amazing questions today and yesterday, and they're really the only answer is we don't know all of these things right now. Keep yourself safe in the meantime. So I have one last question for you is we're trying to have a conference live next year. Your uh, People are saying how great you're doing here. So maybe you can come and join us live next year. Yeah, maybe. yeah and hopefully next year I'll have a lot of my dissertation research done which is um, evaluating what families are doing in the home and what gaps we have in supporting families. Um, yeah. So well, if you need, if you need any other people, contact us. We have, we have a few thousand people living on PN. So let us know, but if you could also finish answering up some of those Q and A's, if you have a chance, if not, I can send them to you later because there's some over on the, the side and then in the Q, Q and A, thank you so much for joining yeah. us today, Mary Beth. Yeah. Thanks so much.